Lionel, Miss Ellen Gatsman, and uh, I work at the County Administrative Board of Jämtland in Sweden, the people of Sweden. And I'm also very grateful for the invitation. Uh, of course, it's very, very nice to be able to visit Poland for the first time. Um, so I'm here to present to you our, our project, project uh, Rivers of Life. Uh, which started in August in 2019, and it, it will end uh, in December 2026. Uh, and 60% of this project is funded by the um, EU Life Pro Program, and 30% from uh, the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management. Mm -hmm. And a little bit about the project organization. So. Uh, it's the County Administrative Board of Gävleborg, Borg, uh, which is uh, south of Jämtland. Uh, that's the coordinating beneficiary and project leaders. And my organization, County of Jämtland, are the deputy project leaders. <clears throat> and we also have uh, six partners. That's the municipality of Åbanåker and Härjedalen, and the Swedish Angler Association, and uh, the Swedish Agency for marine and water management, and also the Swedish Forest Agency and the SCA Forest Products Company. And we have also two co-financers, uh, County of Dalarna and Regina Gambor. So our actions in short are pretty much the same as Matthias said, as echo streams for life. Um, we have a little bit of smaller budget, 8 million 350 euros. And um, with that money, we are doing um, habitat restoration mostly. That's the, what the project's biggest aims are. And restoring streams and rivers of habitat, habitat types uh, 3210 and 3260. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, they're including in that is the restoration of uh, dead wood habitats and um, uh, restoration of uh, spawning sites for, for fish and so on. Um, we do also a small part of restoration of forest wetlands and we replace road culverts that are migratory barriers and removing of dams that are um, were used in the Tolutinian era same as extremes. We also do freshwater pearl mussel introductions, reintroductions into rivers that have uh, been in historically, but are now extinct. And after we restore the rivers, we wait for about two or three spring floods, and then we take mussels from the same catchment areas in a river where we have today about 1.4 million mussels, with maybe 500 to 1,000 back into uh, rivers with uh, yeah, where they've been found historically. Um, we also do the management fishing plans for the whole catchment of the, the catchment areas that we're working in, together with uh, uh, anglers and also the the fishing management units in those areas and. Uh, the aim is to get them to implement the, the management, the fishing management into their organizations. And also the monitoring action. So I will like, focus a little bit more about that instead of the restoration part, which you've already heard about. But we also have one part of the project that's uh, uh, more about public awareness. So we create demonstration areas, partly for <coughs> Uh, used for education for for stakeholders, and uh, ones that are more um, focused on explaining the ecology in our rivers and also uh, the actions that we are carrying out in the project. And we also have um, actions with uh, um, spreading the knowledge. Uh, so the Swedish Anglers Association are working with schools something they call the school stream. We bring out school classes to the streams and uh, show them restoration and uh, the freshwater pearl mussels and 
how to catch the benthic fauna and remove barriers, very popular. And also we have uh, fishing uh, actions or, or we we'll go out fishing with immigrants, both in ice fishing and in summer uh, time to show them what the Swedish nature is all about. Yeah. Um, this is uh, our uh, project area. In uh, Jämtland, we have the River Jingmorn with uh, its whole catchment area, all the tributaries. Uh, the attractions are quite spread without, uh, throughout the area. We have uh, this part of the river Ljusnan, which is called Haridalsjusnan. In Jämtland County and in Gävleborg County, we have the part of the river Ljusnan called the Mellan Ljusnan, and also its tributary Engraon, and the river Boxnan with its tributary Olaförbäcken. Um, we have three target species in our project, and it's this a tiny, tiny liverwort called Microscopania um, that grows on deadwood habitat that's partly flooded uh, during the year, very specific habitat. And today, this wood only exists uh, in what we call cultural wood, but which wood that's left from the timber floating area. So there's almost no in wood in the rivers for this. Uh, species to grow on in the future. And we have the freshwater pearl mussel and also the otter. otter. And of course, there are um, complementing <laughs> um, other species, the, the brown trout, and of course, uh, different benthic fauna. The project's uh, expected impacts are 120 kilometers of restored habitat. Uh, for two um, migratory barriers removed uh, and about a 10 to 20 percent increase in fish for the pearl mussel population, 10 percent increase in otter population, and hopefully 17 new populations of the microscopania labor works. Mm. Yeah, so the timber floating started at about the 1750s, increased in the 1850s, uh, <clears throat> and in the 1930s to 60s, as Matthias said, uh, there was a huge impact using dynamite and uh, modern equipment, and also, as you showed on photos, the uh, surplus machinery from World War II. Um, so um, the river before, Clearing it for, for timber floating with large boulders and rocks that are blown up by dynamites, ending up like this and pushed to the sides. And today, <clears throat> this is what it can look like almost all, all over rivers. And it's hard to see that it's been heavily impacted if you're not aware. So I think it's very important to spread the word to to everyone that our rivers are not actually natural looking and that they're heavily impacted and they're not uh, have they don't have their natural natural process natural processes. Mm. The consequences of mm. the the clearing of rivers are, of course, as you can see here where all the rocks are on the side, the fast flowing water just goes past everything down to the ocean with no lateral connectivity. Uh, so the cleared rivers are always, always, uh, almost always uh, lowered. So the water don't reach the floodplains. So I said, talked about before here too. Um, we have the, the lack of water retention features in the landscape and the lack of small fractions such as gravel, sand, etc., which are important for, of course, a lot of different species. Um, so overall, a homogeneous water environment. Uh, I don't know, do you, do you mention that the restoration techniques have made a, a huge step forward in the last 10 years. So before uh, 
of the more aquatic habitat only focusing on the wetted area. And now a days we have a more holistic approach. Uh, by restoring habitats and processes and functions, not only in the stream, but also on the floodplains. This is a, a fun example where uh, we have Annelon in Jämtland and we found a pristine side, side branch that didn't have any water at all. And of course, since they let all water pass this, they didn't have to blow the boulders with dynamite. <laughs> and uh, they're still there. And we made the water go back into this side branch. So this was done last summer and it will be very interesting to see what happens here in the last uh, couple, following few years. Um, how much time do I have? Still, Still time. <laughs> Um, yeah, I can give just two examples of uh, different streams with different challenges. So, Kvarn Valon in Jämtland, a very short stream section, and it is an old spawning site, a downstream spawning site for brown trout. And today, the only spawning site for the, the brown trout in the Hemburn Lake. And there's also some historical interests uh, from the timber flipping era. So they're both the limiting factors for the restoration. And in Kola Kwebeken, in, uh, in Jävleborg County, uh, also a very short stream section, but no limits uh, coming to restoration. So this is the Kvarn Valor with the, uh, this uh, wall from timber floating that we had to leave because of the historical interests. Uh, because it's very, very close to road and quite close to small communities, so easy to visit to we want to see what the timber floating was all about. And so we could only move out the rocks that are underneath the vegetation here from, from the left side <coughs> into to the river, and we also have to be very careful with the existing spawning grounds for trout. So this is the result for from uh, yeah, all the, the, the limitations in that section. And this is Kuala Huebeken, which had a lot of uh, <clears throat> blown up rocks and boulders, which sharp. So the, the, the rests of it are very sharp, and we had to bury it underneath and cover it with rocks of a more natural uh, shape, which uh, was helpful to get to, to higher, get the bottom higher. But um, I see some trees are the same, these pine trees. Uh, we now have a lateral connectivity and, uh, on both sides. Same stretch, but from a bird's eye view. So the expected results then, well, a slower water flow in the streams. Water retention features in the landscape, um, a variation of bottom fractions, and the lateral, lateral connectivity with the natural disturbance of the floodplains. Overall, more heterogeneous uh, water environment, of course, to, uh, to contribute to an increase in biodiversity and a more climate change resilient water environment. So a little bit about our monitoring actions. We do uh, monitoring of morphology with the drones and uh, also on the detailed uh, areas before and after restoration with the depths and the wides and uh, what kind of bottom material and so on. And we revisit our spawning sites and uh, take good notification on, on how we place the dead wood and we'll have experts out there in a few years looking for new establishments of the microscopania. Uh, we'll do the monitoring of hydrology also by drones and by connectivity measuring with the data loggers, putting a saline solution upstream and then measuring the peaks and how long it takes for the peak to come and how sharp it is. I'll show you a video of this very soon. 
and also the, the monitoring of biology by electrofishing with streams and uh, in streams and from the boats and the electrofishing the Duchidia larvae, which is the larvae from the freshwater pearl mussel that uh, attaches to the juvenile trout gills. And we do snorkel surveys uh, to, uh, to give us an estimation about the fish population. So this is where we, we count uh, the number and different sizes of uh, the species of fish we can see. Um, and otter inventories. So starting, right, so um, this is just an uh, animation of our, our saline solution uh, conductivity measuring. The, the, on the left hand side, you can see the area after it's been restored and on the right hand side before, and this is a, a, how fast the, the saline solution moves uh, in this section on the right hand before restoration and left uh, after. And you can see there was almost no water on this side branch beforehand and now um, takes about double the time for the water to move through this area. Um, yeah. And I'll show you, maybe, is there a way to lower the volume? Um, just to show you what it looks like when we do our snorkels, the snorkel inventories. Um, here in the review, snum. Oh, it's not working very well. So we, we go three people in the, on the, to, to count the whole wide width of the river and um, count the fish we see. Here it was railing, but it's not working. I don't have to look at this. So maybe this one's working better with the brown trout. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Visit us at our website and on Facebook. And I can also uh, tell you that we have a few uh, papers here. So one about, uh, well, how we do our uh, restoration with excavators. And just one about the, the project.